Uh oh. Well, now you have to get back. We're good. We're, we're, we're there. Good. Yeah. Ready. Do it. Hi, I'm Mally Shansfeld, Managing Editor of Endodontic Practice US, a MedMark publication. Welcome to a continuing education presentation and question and answer with Dr. Ryan Walsh. In our webinar today, we'll be discussing the, the latest in advanced bioceramics and how to apply the benefits in your clinical practice. Before we get started, I would like to invite viewers to use the chat box on the right side of your screen to ask any questions, and your questions will be answered at the end of the session. Also associated with this presentation is a free CE quiz. Within 30 minutes after the end of the webinar, we will email all attendees the presentation replay, along with instructions on how to access the CE quiz. Now I'm pleased to introduce our guest for today. Dr. Ryan Walsh attended the University of Iowa, where he completed both his biology and dental degrees. He continued his education at Texas A&M University College of Dentistry, where he received his specialty certificate in endodontics and a Master of Science in Oral Biology. Dr. Walsh is a board-certified diplomate of the American Board of Endodontics and an adjunct clinical professor at Texas A&M University College of Dentistry. He has written and published multiple articles in peer-reviewed journals and serves as a key opinion leader for several companies in the dental industry. Dr. Walsh has lectured both nationally and internationally on bioceramic materials and maintains an active research interest in this field. Dr. Walsh, we turn the webinar over to you to learn more about our topic for today. Well, wonderful. Thanks, Mally. Thanks for the, the wonderful introduction. And uh, thank you all for, for tuning in on this great Thursday night, or as we like to call it, pre-Friday. So I'm glad that uh, <clears throat> you're joining me for a little, uh, little webinar. And this is kind of part two of one that we gave um, a few weeks back. And this is kind of more clinically focused. <clears throat> I want to really talk about how to endo your way. So meaning how we can specifically dial and cater endodontic needs to your own practice needs, because we all practice just slightly different, but we're all using similar materials. So how can we mold a, a, a protocol and a, uh, and a material set that, that functions the best for you? So like Mally said, I'm, I'm from Iowa, uh, go Hawks, and uh, came down to Texas. As they say, I got here as fast as I could. And uh, now I maintain a full-time private practice out in Keller, Texas, uh, and I'm still an adjunct faculty down at Texas A&M, which is formerly Baylor, uh, down in Dallas. Uh, and as a disclaimer, uh, I am a key opinion leader for several dental companies, uh, and I have received honorarium uh, for, for talks similar to this. Uh, and the reason I do that is because I use these materials. Uh, I use these materials both in my private practice uh, and when I'm an adjunct pr clinical professor at Texas A&M. So I bring these products to those residents so that they can use them, get hands-on experience. And then right now we actually have four current research projects going on uh, involving our office uh, and the Texas A&M residents uh, gathering data and developing them in a whole bunch of different uh, facets to help promote bioceramic materials. So let's start with our learning objectives for tonight. You know, first, I guess, first and foremost, I want you to become familiar with the modern bioceramic materials, which ones are present on the market, some similarities and differences between them, how to incorporate those into your practice, uh, financial impacts, because there's, again, on the bioceramic marketplace, there's new materials being introduced every day. And so how are these going to complement your practices? How are you going to uh, utilize these materials to best effectively manage your case uh, caseload, as well as manage your financial overhead? Because as practice owners, those are things that we have to be concerned with. And then case selection for bioceramics. Are there specific cases that lend towards certain types of bioceramics? In other words, uh, is a sealer more advantageous in one case versus a putty versus a uh, self mix? Uh, it depends. And so we'll walk through a few of those as well to give you some case examples and, and things to uh, uh, add to your armamentarium. And lastly, but not uh, last but not least, I want you to develop a method to be able to endo your way. Again, I'll show you how I endo my way and how I, uh, my partners at our practice, we endo our way, but I also want you to keep that in mind as we go. How are you going to use these materials to incorporate them into your private practice life uh, to better serve your patients and facilitate the, the best, most effective and predictable treatments? So I found this, uh, this statistic and I thought it was really interesting, A, because we're now five years removed, uh, but it says in 2017, the global bioceramics market stood at a valuation of $12.5 billion. 
and is projected to witness an impressive growth of the, over the next couple of years. And the outlook, outlook of bioceramics remains positive for the next couple of years. Well, we're past the next couple of years, and I would say the outlook is, is tremendous. Not only if we rewind to 17, 2017, have other products been introduced, but now we have some more peer-reviewed articles and some research and some literature to support our use of bioceramic materials. And so I think this sector in endodontics, uh, and as I learned last night from Nate Lawson, <clears throat> into restorative dentistry. So I think this is not only impacting the endodontist or general dentists doing root canals, but this is impacting general dentists as well as far as your restorative materials, uh, both as a, at a composite level, a bonding level, uh, and as uh, being incorporated into full coverage restorations or onlays, inlays, things, things like that. So I really think bioceramics are going to play a, a key role as we move forward in dentistry together. And so let's talk briefly about the basics of what are bioceramics. Uh, you know, bioceramics can be used as, as artificial hips. You know, that's kind of where I think of where they started is that you have a ball in a socket, but you need the body to heal onto and osseo integrate onto this. You know, it's not something that we can allow to fibro fibrously encapsulate because that's not going to be a weight-bearing joint. That's not going to be sufficient uh, for a long-term replacement of a joint. So we need bioactivity to allow osseointegration and uh, allow this to become a true part of the body that functions on a daily basis. And they're also uh, used in dental implants, not only the restoration on, uh, on the coronal surface, but also uh, bioceramic zirconia implants, root replacements, and abutments. And so we're seeing these types of things be integrated all over the dental environment. But we're not only just talking about bioceramics. More importantly, we're talking about a very specific subset of those called bioactive bioceramics. And what that means is that we're not just simply placing this material because we know it's tolerated by the body. What we're trying to do is we're trying to stimulate the body's natural reaction or the natural response and promote healing in a way that we haven't been able to with previous materials. And so here we're talking about MTA type tricalcium silicates, bioactive glasses, and things that stimulate hydroxyapatite formation. And on the bottom right, you know, things that were are materials that are bioactive and inductive, are they inert or are they biomimetic? You know, some of these are semantic differences, but on the same token, uh, if we can be biomimetic and truly mimic what the body is has naturally produced all the better. So I think we're trending toward um, these types of, of bioactive and bioinert products, or excuse me, bioactive and biomimetic products. And here locally in, in endodontics, you know, we're seeing these come out as sealers and putties. So we'll talk more about these as we progress through the talk tonight, uh, but I just wanted to show you a little sampling or a little smattering of, of what we're looking at. But the ad advantages of bioceramics, well, first, they're bioactive. They're non-staining, uh, and they're antibacterial and dimensionally stable. So unlike products we've had before, we're stimulating tissue formation. So in this, this study that we conducted back in 2016, it shows you the induced mineral mineralization at the root tip, and even the arrow there shows you cementum formation directly adjacent to that product. Uh, it, it, to me, it's amazing that we can recreate cementum, which to me is kind of the, one of the most overlooked tissues in the, in the whole tooth formation. Uh, it's also non-staining. Uh, again, the original products were not non-staining, but now we've progressed. Uh, so you can see here from a from a study back in 2013 that I conducted. You know, we're looking at the left product has bismuth oxide, which clearly shows a discoloration, kind of that brownish, rusty type color. Uh, and then the product on the right, which is zirconia or tantalite. Uh, in this particular case, this is BC putty, and so it holds a nice, color fast, stable uh, product. And that's especially important if we're using this in anterior pediatric teeth. Uh, the right, as we move to the right, antibacterial, it's got a high pH. So this pH spikes up to about 12, similar to calcium hydroxide, because that's one of the setting products. But again, that's helping to reduce the, the threshold of bacteria, penetrate those tubules, and overall help disinfect our, our root canal system. And they're dimensionally stable. If anything, we get slight expansion here. And that's a, that's a really good thing. We're not talking about a voluminous expansion that could crack and fracture roots long-term, but we're talking about one that's not shrinking and pulling away from the canal walls, but rather one that's incorporating water or incorporating the dentin tubule fluid and uh, allowing hydroxyapatite formation into the dentin tubules. 
So again, uh, the, I want to highlight this drawing here. This is or this uh, artwork. Uh, this is from John Sirbu. He's a he's an Iowa grad. Was a couple of years below me, and he does some really awesome uh, dental cartoons. So a little plug for John, but. I think this is great. You know what? No pulp in the orange juice, but here we're not just root canalists. We're not just here uh, to take out pulps. That's not why we're here any longer. You know, we're also not here just to fill a hole. You know, back in the the old days of doing root canals, it it was how how we can get the contents out and then how we can plug a hole. You know, today we're more advanced than that. You know, we're talking about how can we stimulate dentin reformation? How can we uh, Stimulate, uh, uh, stimulate hydroxyapatite formation. And how are these t uh, materials interacting with body tissues, both intra, intrapulpal as well as uh, periapically? So there's a lot going on here that we have not been able to access or not had the privilege of using in, uh, in the history of endodontics. So again, great healing at the root tip after a root in surgery. Yeah, these are fantastic promising images showing that that we are able to get the healing that we like. And again, back to the study that we did in 2013. So let's talk first about a few major players in the game. Um, I know we're all familiar with one or two, but let's talk about a few more just to broaden our horizon so that we can kind of follow these materials as we uh, run different tests and as we evaluate them further down the road. And so the major players in the game are the MTA bio uh, based bioactive sealers. And you've seen many of these before. What I'm not going to focus on today is the resin-based bioactive sealers. You know, again, they're here, they're prominent, but that's not really the main focus of my talk tonight. So we'll disregard those for now <clears throat> and talk about the main players here. And so these are all things you've seen before. With innovative bioceramics <clears throat> out of Canada, we have the BC family of products, we have the iRoot, we have FKG over in the Middle East, and we have Edge here in the United States. So all of these are one family of innovative bioceramics. We have Avalon Biomed, which are the Neo Sealer products or the Neo family of products. And then we have uh, Sarah Seal. We have the, a, the newer AH Plus bioceramic from Dentsply. Um, and then we have a, a, a couple other products as well, such as the Angelus products, the, uh, the Septodont products. Interestingly, of all of these products, the only ones developed and manufactured in the USA are the Neo family of products from Avalon Biomed. I was actually at their facility uh, just, just a short week ago watching the manufacturing process, not only from the powder to the liquid uh, to the gel, they're, in, uh, they're placing it into the syringes, they're individually wrapping these syringes and then packaging them for you. So I thought it was really interesting to get perspective on how this is done here in the United States. You know, not to disc discount others that are made uh, in Canada, made um, in Brazil or Korea. That's not at all the case. But I also wanted to emphasize that, hey, this is made here in America. It's made right down in Houston, Texas. So let's talk briefly about primary ingredients. You know, really, if you boil it down, when Dr. Torbenajad was working uh, on the, the original MTA, it's dye and tricalcium silicate. It's Portland cement, more or less. And so that's the primary ingredient and the pri primary bioactive ingredient here. You know, we also, many of the products have calcium aluminate. And we won't discuss that a whole lot tonight. Again, let's save time for, for another lecture on another night. Uh, but this has some interesting pro uh, properties as well. It's acid resistant. You know, and where are we placing these materials? Well, we're placing them down into a root canal uh, that has an acidic periapical lesion. Uh, we're placing it into the oral environment. Uh, so calcium aluminate not only can help increase the compressive strength once it's set, but it also uh, prevents acid washout. Uh, we're using an organic liquid, you know, sometimes we think of PEG or glycerin or so something along those lines, um, but each one's a little different uh, given that particular brand's proprietary blend. And then last but not least, radio pacifiers. Uh, I think many of, many of the original products have transitioned from using that bismuth oxide, which we know stains or discolors teeth, moving into zirconium or tantalum, uh, or excuse me, zir zirconia or tantalite, rather. Uh, uh, that will allow a color stable restoration. And then from these main materials, there's proprietary, proprietary components that, you know, mixing in different ratios can alter the setting time, working time, again, acid stability, the handling properties, things of that nature. So the main four ingredients, different ratios create different products. So interestingly enough, uh, there is a band, I believe, out of <clears throat> Japan called New Endo. 
uh, and I have to be Googling for this particular webinar and came up with this. And so I was uh, very interested that they have this uh, rock and sports car with new endo. Uh, and then instead of the parental advisory here, we have the dental advisory. So what I'm going to talk about is truly factual information. Uh, I'm not just pulling these this information out of thin air. So I do want to talk again. Our learning objective is one of them is talking about the practical impact on your practice. What does that mean? Well, it comes down to dollars and cents. I mean, we're not in dentistry only for the money. That's ridiculous. We're here to treat patients. We're here to treat apical disease. But on the same token, uh, we need to take into account a financial perspective as well because we are running a business. We do need to make sure that we're a profitable business so we can continue to provide, provide this care for our patients. So I've broken this down a little bit for you. Uh, on the left, you see the product. So the first couple here are our Neo family of products. Then we go to the, the endo sequence and edge, which are, uh, again, the innovative bioceramic products, moving down to the AH plus and things like that. So what I really want to show you is the price per dose. Look over in the far right column. Uh, and I'm not a math person. I just had to make a, so a little bit of long division here, but we got there. And what I want to show you is that several products here have a price point that's incredibly affordable. And not to say that spending $8 on a root on a, a one case in a whole root canal is expensive. That's not, it's not given the relative uh, price of the root canal. However, uh, if you can have a similar outcome or a better outcome with a product that has superior uh, handling properties for say, well, why would you not go with one that's that. And so in this case, uh, I want to show you or highlight here that NeoSealer Flow in the 4.4 gram, uh, you can get that for $3.98 per dose. And the only thing that, that comes close to comparison there is the Diarute BioSealer at the bottom. Um, and, you know, to be honest, I'm not using Diarute BioSealer and not to, not to diss on that, not at all. But I think made here in the U.S., you can get a sealer uh, that's $3.98 a gram. That's half the price of some of these other materials that are out there. And so what does that mean? It's, it showed me the money. Hey, we're trimming our overhead. We get to pass on excellent care to our patients. Again, these are all things that matter. We can now afford to keep up with the, the inflation that has occurred in our hire, assistant hiring and front desk hiring. You know, I don't know about any of you, but um, you know, what we were paying people four or five years ago is, is not real money today. And so anytime that we can... Uh, use a, uh, an equal or superior product and cut our overhead, but well, we have more money to spend uh, within the office. So uh, sealer comes in two components, right? So we have not only uh, do we have uh, the sealer itself, but we have the, the tips, we have the delivery, uh, delivery tips. And so here are a host of different delivery tips uh, that I found on the market. Uh, again, many of I tried to tie these with the product that they come from uh, so that you can get a brief comparison. And these tips range anywhere from, you know, buck 76 all the way down to you know, 50 cents a use. So let me categorize these a little different for you because I think there's three main types here. Uh, and again, it's like I stole this from Baskin Robbins because they come in so many different flavors. You know, you have different colors, different shapes, different cannula tips, some with stoppers, some without, some are... Uh, high, uh, highly effective at reducing waste and others, uh, not as much. And so here, the practical impact, I kind of compared these and lined them up such that, you know, you're getting these small cannulas on the left. Now, the one on top has a stopper on it. Uh, and at first, I really didn't take a lot of stock or value in that, uh, only because I figured, hey, I'm not delivering it at the root apex. That's not going to be a, a concern for me. As I've practiced, this has become my absolute favorite tip because of just that fact that I can measure and develop it or and deliver it exactly wherever I need it in the root canal system. And so um, what I thought I would do is take the bottom tip and thread a, uh, sorry, take the, uh, the tip without a stopper and thread a stopper on, and you can't do that. So uh, it's very challenging. If you figure a way, let me know. But nonetheless, the one with the stoppers, 50 cents cheaper. Now the two middle, they're kind of the, more wasteful, if you will, types of tips. And they come with a variety of different sealers and they range uh, quite a range of prices, 60 cents to you know $1.13. We're almost double there as well. And then the, the most stark contrast is over on the right, just a simple metal cannula that screws to a lure lock. Uh, we're talking almost a dollar savings between those. So why is there a difference between the top row and the bottom row? Well, they're all re relatively the same, but this is Avalon Biomed's pricing. So my, 
my thought here is that even if you're using another brand sealer, you should be using Avalon Biomed tips. They're going to save you save you money by using exactly the same tip that you've been using. And again, my favorite tip has that stopper on it. Uh, I use it religiously on, on nearly every single case I'm doing these days. So I want to show you why I like this tip. Uh, just a quick little video. Uh, this is an MB and MB2 canal system in a uh, plastic tooth. So I can deliver my sealer into the apical third consistently. And then because the sealer flows so well, I watch it come out my MB2. Uh, I do this routinely uh, in my daily practice. And so that way I know I'm getting sealer delivered to the apex. Now I want to be cautious not to bind that little cannula into the, into the canal space because then there's potential for extrusion. But I think the simple fact you're seeing here that I placed it till it bound, pulled it back just slightly, and then expressed, I'm allowing, uh, I'm able to get my material into the apical third and take out any of the guesswork of whether that sealer is being delivered with hydraulic pressure uh, through the gutta purchase system. So again, financial perspective. <clears throat> Some of you have seen a similar slide before, uh, but I want to uh, kind of directly compare endo sequence high flow and neo sealer flow, because I think these are the two most comparable sealers um, on the high level market here. So endo sequence uh, high flow is, is um, claimed to be relatively heat tolerant. Uh, the downside here, in my opinion, is that it comes in smaller tubes and it's more expensive than the regular uh, BC sealer. Not to say it's bad, that's not at all the case. I've used this and, and I've used BIOS or, or Brasser products for thousands of cases, but it's not inexpensive. And so here I picked the, uh, the tip without a stopper because that's the one available with this product and the uh, BC high flow. And you know, roughly if you wanna go, go out per year, you're at 10, a uh, little over $10 per case. If you're doing a thousand cases a year, it's a little over 10 grand. Now, if you're an endodontist, you're doing more cases than that. Well, just multiply that. So let's compare that, try to compare apples to apples here with Neo Sealer Flow. Well, the sealer itself is substantially cheaper, less than half. The tip is cheaper. And so you result with a, uh, a cost per case that's almost half. So again, you multiply that out per year, you have a potential savings of over 5,000 bucks if you're doing 1,000 cases a year. And you know what we don't want to do is shoot ourselves in the foot. Again, we can reuse these funds to put back into the practice to increase marketing to increase pay for our, our uh, staff. So these are things that, uh, you know, 5,000 bucks isn't just a little pocket change. So uh, one thing I've also encountered and that, again, I've used many bioceramic uh, materials uh, over the past decade. And so I've used edge bioceramic, I've used BC sealer, I've used uh, uh, Neo MTA. So I've used a handful of these. And uh, what I always find interesting is that, <clears throat> If I log online and try to find pricing, yeah, I can log onto my account and I see X number of dollars per price or for my price. But what's frustrating is that if I talk to my rep and say, hey, I want 100 tubes, well, my price immediately goes down. So there's a difference between the marketed or the listed price and what we call the street price. And so to me, it, that's just a little unfair because what if you're a general dentist who's only doing a few root canals a month or a few root canals a week? You, you should have the privilege of the same pricing. So what I think is, is uh, very advantageous about Avalon Biomed is that the street price is the online price. So if you go online and you buy 100 tubes, it's the same price and it's still a bargain for, uh, for the superior material that you're getting. So to me, it makes more sense. I don't expect my patients to negotiate the price of their root canal and I don't expect to go to the grocery store and negotiate a what the price of bread is. So I expect when I go online, I'm getting the best price all the time. And that's not always the case. And so let, let's move from uh, more kind of background uh, didactic type information to more bioceramics in your practice. So every case I show you uh, is, a is a case from my practice that I've done or my partner's done. And where my partner's done it, I'll show him credit. Otherwise, uh, these are all cases from, uh, from my practice. And so here, again, we have a whole bunch of, uh, we have a bunch of criteria that we can use, uh, dentin, dentin formation, PDL formation, bone and osseous formation to lead to success all via bioceramic materials. And so let's start off by looking uh, at a study done by Elizabeth Chabowski uh, and um, Dr. Jenny He, who's a, uh, a mentor of mine as well. Uh, and she, they do beautiful work. 
And so I thought this was an excellent, excellent article published uh, several years ago. And what they found is that they retrospectively went back and looked at these cases uh, that were all done in a private practice setting with BC Sealer. And they found a 90.9%, 91, let's call it, percent success rate. So that's fantastic. Our success rates are supposed to be above 90%. You know, as, as endodontists, we hold ourselves to a really high standard. So 90% is fantastic. I, I think you're going to be hard pressed to find that anywhere else in medicine that somebody can give you a 90% success rate. So in our practice, I tried to replicate that. And this was prior to the pre-mixed products. So this is when we were self-mixing NeoMTA2 and NeoMTA+. And so we had a very similar set of teeth with a relatively similar recall. And our overall success was 91 as well. So I think that's really interesting that we're using two different bioceramics, two different practices, and we're getting nearly the same success rate. So I think that says a lot about the high quality of materials that we're using. And also that, uh, that Neo MTA, kind of the newcomer to the game, can perform at a level similar to BC, because I think that's kind of the gold standard for our comparison. And interestingly, with this particular case series, it was not all just used as sealer. One of the big advantages of using something where you're self-mixing is that you don't have to be stuck with one modality. In other words, here on, these dis on this distal canal, I used it as a wet sand consistency and packed that distal canal solidly with NeoMTA2. Whereas the mesial canals of the top case and all of the canals of the bottom case uh, were done using a sealer consistency. So same product, same gel, different consistency. And so again, a little bit of versatility there uh, that's not always present with the pre-mixed materials. So again, let's talk about historical limitations of bioceramics. I was just talking about that in the sense that, you know, you mix it to a wet sand type of consistency. We're all familiar with placing the wet sand. Personally, I really enjoy doing that uh, uh, in, in certain particular cases. But again, that's been a historical limitation. You know, how do we do this? It's time consuming sometimes to mix. But I think I would argue that these this type of mixture allows these types of outcomes and that I don't like to use putty here because introducing putty 18 or 20 millimeters down uh, and getting a consistent stop to me is challenging because I feel like that putty likes to pull back up on my pluggers. So here I can mix it like a wet sand and then pack that down uh, at the apex and get a nice firm block of that NeoMTA material and, and apexify this tooth. So I think some of the previous disadvantages of handling are actually advantages for some of our cases. It's all about case selection. So here's an interesting case uh, that I like to show uh, because I think it has a lot of moving parts. And so this is a case that I saw uh, kind of on second opinion uh, from another endodontist down the street. And I think everybody here looking at this is saying, that's a nice looking root canal. And I couldn't agree more. And the endodontist who did this is a reputable endodontist. They do really nice work. So when I get something like this, it always kind of makes me scratch my head. Well, what's causing this uh, furcation radiolucency? You know, is there a crack or fracture in the tooth? Is there a perforation? What exactly is going on? Uh, but this lady is an accountant for uh, a dental software company. So I, I, I talked to her and I said, let's at least open this tooth to see what's going on. I'd hate to condemn it to an implant at this point. And so we opened the tooth and sure enough, we saw a perforation. As soon as I started removing uh, got a purchase from the mesial buccal canal, I started seeing blood come up. And then, although it's a little challenging to see here because of the, the dark circle around it, I tried to highlight it with green arrows. That's the perforation. I can actually see that palatal tissue in my microscope. So I know right out of the gate, I'm going to have to approach this a little differently uh, than I would my, my normal root canal by just using sealer and gutta percha. So here, what we did is we repaired uh, the perforation with NeoMTA2. And you can see that by the little the irregular shape here as it's condensed against that soft tissue in the perforation. And so this was in 2015. And we saw her back uh, for a six-month recall. And we saw some healing. And that looks great. We saw her back for a year recall and were nearly healed in the furcation. Uh, also, equally as importantly, the apices are remaining healed. So that's absolutely fantastic. Well, we see her back at a, a, a two-year recall, and I would consider that healed. I think the furcation tissue looks great. The width of the periodontal ligament uh, is the same um, all the way around. We're not seeing any radiolucent lesion any longer. 
in that frication. So here's how I approach this. So it's a single material. I just used it a couple different ways like I described earlier. So I used the NeoMTA2 as a sealer for the apical third in the mesial canals. In the distal canals, I used it as a sealer for the entire canal space. Then I went back in with my heat source or my system B and seared off just below the perforation. So I know that now my uh, apical portion is sealed and now I'm gonna take the new MTA2 and mix it and put it in one of these MTA blocks like a wet sand consistency so I can predictably pack that down at the level of the uh, frication perforation and then back up above it. So I literally have new MTA above and below the perforation so it's sealed all throughout. And then I, I pack that back up into the, the canal chamber. So again, one material, multiple methodologies, I think that's an advantage of some of the self-mixed materials that we have that are somewhat archaic, but nonetheless, uh, in my mind and in my practice, uh, serve, a, serve an important role. And the next case is one from Dr. Attar. Uh, he's my colleague here at Advanced Endodontics, uh, and he does some beautiful work. And this is an excellent case of vital pulp therapy, especially now coming up with AAE just around the bend uh, in their vital pulp therapy classes. I believe Dr. David Witherspoon's giving one uh, Thursday, I believe. So a shout out to Dr. Witherspoon. So if you're going to be out at AAE, tap into that. He's a wonderful resource. And so here, uh, deep carries on a young person. You know, this person's 12, maybe, uh, give or take, given the, the uh, apical formation of the roots here. And so he, what Dr. Attar did is he mixed Neo-MTA2 with the anti-washout gel. He made that into a putty, rolled it into a ball, and then gently placed it over the pulp stumps after, or the uh, the canal orifice rather, after he removed uh, the caries and the inflamed pulp tissue. So again, keep, a, keep in mind the date stamps here. I try to accurately date stamp all of my radiographs. So this is in 2019. We saw that patient back. We're starting to see a little dentin formation directly under the, the uh, NeoMTA and the apices are continuing to develop. So we know that it's maintaining vitality in the root portions. And we continue to see it back in 2019. Again, those roots are further developed we have a thicker layer of dentin this time. And moving into 2020, near complete formation of those root tips. And look at us here in 2021, pretty much complete formation of those root tips. They continue to develop in length and width. Uh, we have a nice dentin bridge between that Neo-MTA and the pulp space. And again, suggesting that these, uh, the pulp or the radicular pulp here is still vital because we had that formation over the past several years. So beautiful case for vital pulp therapy here. And so resorption. I don't know about y'all in your practices, but in my practice, uh, I think resorption is an epidemic um, from colleagues I've talked to around the world. I really think it's a pandemic and maybe that's too soon to use that word. That might be a little uh, aggressive, but we're seeing it more and more. And I think part of it's because we're uh, we have better technologies like cone beam CT, but we're also more acute diagnosticians. We're able to see these things at a smaller, uh, at a smaller phase, so we're diagnosing them earlier, uh, and we also now have some treatment modalities for them. So, you know, it's really a question in some of these cases. You know, is this is it cold steel and sunshine? You know, do we have to extract that tooth? Are we able to instrument it and maintain it? You know, some of these are truly heroic feats. Um, so I want to focus on a case and kind of walk you through my protocol here for this tooth. And I would say that uh, this was a little bit of a heroic case uh, with a lot of patient compliance. And so this lady um, came into our office knowing that she had an issue because she could feel a hole on the back of her tooth. And as you can see, rightfully so, there is soft tissue growing up into the cingulum area. She did not want me to take a pre-op radiograph because that might be too much radiation exposure. But after discussion, she was allowing me to take a CT scan. So this is my pre-op film. When I talked to her, I saw this and discussed that, you know, I don't think saving this tooth is probably the best option. Uh, we have soft tissue growing into the cingulum. We have extensive uh, invasive and cervical resorption extending subcrestally. Uh, the best case, the tooth structure ends on the palate at the crestal bone. There's just a whole host of issues here why you shouldn't treat this. So I recommended extraction. Well, she accepted that that day and then came back the next week saying, I, I don't want to extract my tooth. Uh, it doesn't matter what you do. I want to try to save it. And if it doesn't work, I'm okay with that. 
but at least we know we tried. So what I did uh, was I removed all the uh, all is a strong word. I removed as much resorption as I could internally with an ultrasonic, getting all the way out to the peripheral walls, getting them thin, but also trying to remove as much as I can, but maintain a nice peripheral tooth structure uh, that will hold a restoration. So from there, knowing that the, the palatal extended to the crestal bone, I used Fuji uh, 9 Extra here at True Glass Ionomer to build up that cingulum. And you, although it looks a little jagged here on the edges, I actually used a, a finishing diamond burr to smooth that back once we were done. And I think you'll see the results here in just a moment. But what you can also see on the lower left picture is that I started packing the OMTA uh, in a wet sand type mixture down in the apical part of the canal. And I continued to pack this all the way up into the tooth until I got to uh, about the CEJ level. And from there, I switched and restored with Fuji again. So that was my, that's my post-op. And here's my recall. Look how well the soft tissue is healing up onto the Fuji. Uh, it's definitely supracrestal. We have nice healing apically, and we're not seeing any continuation of the resorption. So we arrested the resorption, allowed the body to, to heal naturally, got soft tissue reattachment. Now we have normal three millimeter probing depths on the palate. And so here's from 2018, 2020 on a two year recall. She still has the tooth. She's still excited and happy every time she comes back because we are able to save that tooth, although it truly had a really hopeless prognosis. I think here, the ability of us to use bioceramics um, and uh, some other favorable restorative material to allow epithelial attachment is really an, an advantage here in our clinical techniques. So what about revascularization? Um, to me in private practice, I don't get a whole lot of opportunities for this, uh, either due to patient compliance, patient selection, case selection, things of that nature. Uh, but I want to share one with you. And so this was a young lady who presented to us back in 2016. And this is what I saw clinically. And so what we're seeing, we're seeing a dens evaginatus, which is interesting because we don't often see those cases. And so this is a, uh, what I thought was a perfect case to try revascularization. Uh, I talked to mom and mom was all on board for it. The patient couldn't have been more compliant. Uh, I jokingly told them afterward, I said, if half of my adult patients were as good as you in the dental chair, my life would be a walk in the park. Uh, so she was just absolutely fantastic. So we, we tried revascularization here. Um, so we did this over two visits with calcium hydroxide intermedicament, intercanal medicament. And then I placed NeoMTA from here up to about the level of the crystal bone. And I got a little bit more NeoMTA in, in there than I bargained for. Uh, I'd like that to be a little thinner. But nonetheless, we were able to stimulate that bleeding from the apical tissue reintroduce those stem cells uh, into that apical canal space, and then I sealed it with a composite resin. So here she is in 2016, and I lost her to recall. I called mom, I called the patient. They live about 60 miles away from us, so it's not really convenient for them to come in and visit, but I was finally able to get her back last year, and I was astounded at what I saw. So we got length, we got width, um, <clears throat> yeah, it's dystrophic calcification within that canal space or tertiary dentin formation, but she still has this tooth with increased tooth length, uh, and she's a happy gal. It's asymptomatic and functional. We're not seeing any periapical pathology. I was, I was very, very pleased. So again, bioceramic materials are, are really advantageous in, in our everyday case selection because we don't know when this is going to walk through the door. You know, I didn't anticipate seeing uh, a Denzi vaginatus uh, at any time during that day, and it just happened to be the RK selection. So those were all cases um, <clears throat> primarily with self-mixed materials. <clears throat> so now most of us are using pre-mixed materials, and I call it the pre-mixed re-evolution because it's really been a slow, steady transition from the pre-mixed materials early uh, pro root MTA and uh, you know credit uh, Brassler with their BC sealer and BC putty are coming out with the pre-mixed materials that we all have grown to love. So not only are they newer materials, but they have some superior handling properties. Uh, innately, most of them are anti-washout, but I think the big thing here in my mind, at least in my practice, is that it's repeatable. 
I get the sealer, I get the putty, and every time I know it's going to be a consistent consistency. And so I know exactly what I'm getting when I get into that case. So again, you're talking about the premixed materials. Uh, they're advantageous because we can inject them into the canals. You know, we no longer have to mix them on a pad, maybe put them into a centric syringe or try to uh, pack it down in a, in a deep canal. No, here we can inject our sealers into the canal space or they form nice solid little cones here for doing root end surgeries, which we'll talk about here in just a little while. So a lot of advantages here to using that. Along with the premixed materials, I want to talk about the obturation trends and obturation techniques. Because, you know, historically, it was, uh, it was a uh, gutta percha centric obturation. In other words, we're using sealer, but we're trying to fill that canal with as much gutta percha as we possibly can. So back in 2009, uh, only 3% of endodontists were using a single cone with a bioceramic. You know, that just, that's kind of when I was coming into my residency. Uh, it was a suspicious technique, I should say. Not everybody was on board. It was new, uh, but had some distinct advantages. Well, let's fast forward to 2020. Nearly 60% of practitioners worldwide are using a bioceramic material. So 60% of all of our worldwide practitioners is a huge number. So I think as a group, as dentistry as a whole, we're seeing the benefits of these materials and trending toward using them on a much more frequent basis. And so, again, I want to talk about sealer-centric versus gutta percha centric uh, obturation because these new premixed bioceramic sealers are leading us toward a sealer-centric obturation. Here, we're not trying to fill the canal with gutta percha. We're trying to more or less fill the canal with as much bioceramic material as we can. So that's in contact with the dentin tubules. That's in contact with the lateral canals. That's in contact with the periapical tissues and PDL, all of that good stuff to, again, stimulate that healing process. So I think we're now using gutta percha as a sealer carrier in a, a delivery vehicle rather than being the primary mode of our obturations. So I, I took this from the, the AAE's website, uh, and I believe this is Dr. Uh, Mitu Kohli's uh, discussion here, uh, but I wanted to show this is what we're going for these days with single cone obturation. Look at how well that sealer is adapted peripherally into the fin of that mandibular molar. Uh, look how well it's adapted peripherally uh, to all of the dentin tubules there. And we see the gutta percha just centered relatively in each canal. And we don't have to use as much gutta percha because we want that sealer, we want that bioceramic in contact with all the tissues. So again, let's, let's walk through a few cases here. Uh, here's a case I saw back in uh, 2021. And you know, whenever you see this type of J-shaped radiolucency, it, to me, it just screams fracture. And that's not always the case. But anytime I see that, I certainly talk with my patients and try to educate them about, hey, we may be seeing a fracture here. I can't tell you unless we get into the tooth. And so this patient was on board. So we opened the, opened the tooth. I did not see any fracture running down the mesial marginal ridge into the radicular tooth structure. So we completed the, completed the case. And here I used Neosealer Flow. Uh, and again, I used it with the, the Flex Flow tip because I feel like I can deliver that predictably to the apex uh, or to within the apical third, rather. And then we got a little sealer puff. And then we're seeing this patient back now a year later, almost a year to the day. And so what we were seeing as crestal bone loss or bone loss starting at the crest, that's now migrated up to the apical third. So this confirmed there was no fracture in the tooth, or at least no immediate uh, concern for a fracture. And this tooth is healing well over time. And what you can also see is the little sealer puff uh, from the DB canal is moving within that uh, periapical lesion as healing is occurring. So no adverse effect from, from having that there. Likely either the body will resorb that over time or it will become fibrously encapsulated, either of which should not impact the long-term healing. So talking about sealer centric obturation, uh, I like to show this case because uh, it's, it's interesting. So this was a case that it came from a general dentist of mine who likes me to minimally treat anything we have as far as the restorative. They want to take care of all the restorative work. In other words, they want me to only remove circumpulpal caries, put a sealing barrier in there, do my root canal and seal it. They will take care of all the caries removal, all the restoration on top. And so to, to be kind to them, I, I try to do my very best. And so here, I, uh, we got into the canal. I was unable to get apical patency. 
uh, whether it's a fused system, whether it's taking a 90 degree curve, I can't tell you for sure. I do not have a CT here. But what we ended up doing is we ended up obtrading these canals. And you can see my, my barrier on the front. That's part Fuji, uh, Fuji triage uh, and then part cavit. But the interesting thing here is that this is 100% sealer obturation. There is absolutely no gut aperture in this fuse system. And so I can literally inject the, the sealer into the apical third of the distal canal and watch it flow up both of the mesial canals. And then I withdraw my syringe and then I put a Fuji triage barrier over that so that when he goes to remove the carriers without a rubber dam, our root canal below is protected. So nice radio opacity here. I think uh, most of us would have been hard pressed to, to uh, jump out and say that this was 100% sealer obturation had I not told you it was. So uh, neo sealer flow has has adequate radio opacity, at least for my endodontic knee. And so here's another more simple case, but this was another case that I was concerned with having a fracture. We had that angular bone loss. Uh, the patient wanted to save the tooth because it was a bridge. So, hey, let's let's give it a shot. Let's roll the dice and see what we get. And so this is neocellular flow again. And this is so reminiscent of that plastic block that we used, just a slight apical curvature, um, you know, one root, one canal. We, I like to call it a one holer. And here's where we're at at six month recall. And you can see the, uh, the periapical radiolucency significantly reducing in size. It's remodeling. You can see the difference in, in trabecular pattern. And here we are at a year. And so at a year, I would consider this completely healed, apically, but also coronally in the sense that we're not seeing any further uh, progression of that lateral bone loss to suggest a fracture. And I didn't see one clinically. So we were able to save this patient's bridge uh, by doing by doing a root canal and, and using a bioceramic sealer to stimulate the healing process at the apices, or in this case, at the apex. I like to show this case because this is kind of an internal case control um, using two different types of bioceramic sealers. So again, keep in mind the date stamps here. So we're in late 2018, and her chief complaint was that she had sensitivity to cold and biting on the back tooth. Well, that's fine and well. I want to treat her chief complaint, but I also informed her that there's a, a periapical radiolucency on tooth number 14. And she said, I, that's okay. Let me treat that at a different time. I really just need to get out of pain. And hey, I'm all on board. Right? So we, we treat tooth number 15. And again, I told you I've used multiple types of bioceramic sealers. I used uh, endo sequence uh, BC sealer for thousands of cases. And so here's a BC sealer case from 2018. And we see her back in 2019, and it's healing really well. But at that time, she wants me to now go ahead and retreat tooth number 14. So I did. I treated tooth number, retreated tooth number 14 for her very short after her one-year recall. And then fast forward to the bottom right, and now you can see it's basically a two-year recall on 15 with BC sealer and a one-year recall on tooth 14 with neo sealer flow. So I think we can have great results using multiple bioceramic sealers. And so this kind of harkens back to why do you pick one over the other? And again, things like pricing, things like tip design and all of that kind of go into at least my selection of what I like to keep in my office. And we'll talk a little bit more as, as time goes on as well tonight. This is just a relatively straightforward case where we have carriers in, in what I thought was an, a missed MB2. And sure enough, we got in there and it was just a sharply curved MB2, finished up in late 2019. Again, using neo sealer flow. This was the, literally exactly the same uh, situation as when I inject into MB2 and watch it, or into MB1 and watch it flow up MB2. And then here we are at our one year recall, you know, wonderful healing as well. Again, stimulating the healing at the, at the apical tissues. Our ligament looks nearly uh, completely reformed. And this is a really fun case uh, because A, it's erratics and tooth nerds like me really get pumped up when you see erratics because it's a challenge clinically, but also it's a fun anomaly that you don't see that often. And this lady had irreversible pulpitis in this tooth and uh, after a, a crown had been placed relatively recently. And so we treated this tooth. Uh, let me show you how I approached this treatment uh, because I used both sealers in two different techniques, all within the same case. Let's see if we're, we're rolling. Good. So here I'm injecting neocellular flow uh, into the buccal canals. So here's into MB. And what I want you to look at is look at the darkness, and all of a sudden you'll see the sealer start to flow. The good thing about this small cannula 
is that you can see the sealer all around it. It doesn't plug or take up the entire canal space. And here again, we're going right back to the distal, which is kind of a broad oblong distal. And you'll see it fill back up. And then I'm gonna obturate these two canals and then we'll move to the lingual canals, which, which I obturated with uh, Brassler's BC sealer. So any moment here, there we go. Uh, I'll introduce the, got a percha cone, and then we'll introduce the heat source. <clears throat> I like to give it a little pump, uh, just because I, I, I like getting a little sealer puff when we can. Verify our length, and we'll go ahead and sear off. You know, everybody's seen this before, so I, I don't want to belabor the point. But what you can see is that when it's seared off, there's still liquid there. You know, that's still liquid sealer. That's not desiccated or dried up powder. That's sealer. And so I think that's important because other bioceramic materials don't necessarily have that same heat tolerance, and they desiccate uh, upon heat administration. So here we're packing. I'm going to do the distal canal as well, and I'm going to do a little bit more of a, a deeper sear off here so you can see a little bit better down into the canal space how that sealer behaves. And you can also appreciate here how broad that canal is uh, buccolingually. Again, we'll grab our Andy System B. A little deeper sear off there. And what we're seeing get in focus, you're still seeing sealer. You're still seeing liquid sealer, not only around uh, the orifice, but you're also seeing it as I condense, the sealer is very liquid. So I wanted to highlight that part. So let's now switch over, uh, switch over to BC sealer. And again, I'm using it with the tip that they provide in their, in their kits. And you can see right away, it's a little bit larger tip. It's a little bit more cumbersome. Um, it still gets the job done. Uh, but what I also, uh, don't like about this tip is that I feel that it's wasteful. Uh, I feel like I could still fill a few more canals uh, from what's in this tip. And you see, I'm having a hard time getting it bent to go into that M, uh, ML canal. And now we got it. And now we're gonna, gonna fill it back up. So again, got both canals filled there. And then I wanna see, I wanna show you what happens as we introduce, as we obturate and introduce heat into these, because it's a little different than what you saw with the Neo MTA. So here we're introducing heat, and yeah, there's still some liquid right at the top, but around the canal, oh shoot, let's go back. Around the canal, it looks desiccated, at least to me. Uh, what you can see is it almost looks like a fine powder right here outlining that canal, and you didn't see that in the other case. And that's because the neosealer flow has a higher heat tolerance uh, than does uh, BC high flow or this was BC sealer, uh, it also has a similar effect with the high flow. So let's keep going here. We'll obturate the radix. And again, the most challenging one, I kept this small at a, a 20 master apical, uh, only because I want to maintain that apical curvature. And we heat that. And you're seeing similar results there. And go back with the, the ultra or the uh, obtura. I think that's about it for this case. Good. So uh, here's my case as we went. There's my working length. I took my post ops. And again, each canal is filled differently. So um, these are warm techniques with both sealers. And these are cold techniques with both sealers. So I think really you can see both sealers have similar flow characteristics and similar radiograph appearance and similar handling, except when it comes to heat. That's where I think there's a, a, a definite dichotomy in the two materials but they appear the same. I think I don't think anybody here could tell me that one's a neo, neo canal and one's a BC canal. And so I was so thrilled to get this, this, uh, this young lady back uh, earlier this year, actually just a couple or a month ago now, and show that it's healed. You know, there wasn't any lesion to start with. We're not seeing any development of any lesion. She's asymptomatic and functional. So in my mind as an endodontist, I always wanna see the recall. The treatment's great, but what does it look like over time? And so again, with all these different sealers or with both of these different sealers and all these techniques, we're still seeing beautiful healing aping. Now, talking about the heat, this is one thing I wanna bring up in that if you've, if you've seen my lecture before, you've seen something similar to this. Uh, but as we're walking through, I have the sealers labeled for you. And this is just a heat plate at 190. We're trying to simulate 
close to 200 with is what most of us use uh, in our system Bs. But look at the bottom right first. Look at that. It all of a sudden kind of pills up and forms a little worm, and then it kind of falls over. Whereas the bottom left materials all of a sudden start starting to form all these pores. And it may be starting to turn color just slightly. Just like the picture in the upper right, you're starting to see some color change. And here in just a couple seconds, pardon me, we're going to look at how they behave. So the bottom left uh, is the high flow. And so you still see that it's still a liquid. The bottom right uh, is the AH plus, and that was all crunchy. And then the BC regular, uh, just the regular BC sealer is also crunchy. Whereas the neo sealer flow not only did not discolor, still flowable uh, and didn't have any porosity during, during action. So I'll show you that one more time, just so that you can see. Again, watch the bottom right, the dense ply AH plus. Uh, and the reason why it does this is because of the carrier that it uh, that it contains, and it contains a lot of carrier relative to the cement content here. And so you just see it kind of pill up and make a little snake. So because I've talked about these materials, I also want to talk about the others that I have mentioned previously. Uh, and here we're talking about the edge, we're talking about dye root, and we're talking about the bio C. So same type of thing, Avalon's neo sealer flows in the upper left corner, and that will slowly introduce the others. And here, I want you to focus on the upper right picture first, because look what happens as soon as this touches the heat plate. It's boiling. And this is just at 200 C, and that wasn't even but two seconds sitting there. So that would be very representative of what you'd see if you touch it with a, a system B for a, for a single cone, uh, even more so if you're uh, doing a, a heated down pack. Now, the bottom right is the edge, uh, and that's turning colors and has a few porosities, and that's because it's mimicking the BC sealer. They're the same product, just branded differently. Uh, they're both made by Innovative Bioceramics. So again, watch what happens at the end here. The upper right, although it's boiled, it's still a liquid, whereas the bottom two, they're nice and crunchy. Uh, and then again, the upper left is, is kind of the control here in my mind using the Neo Sealer flow. So I just have this again, but we'll skip over that. I think you all got the gist of what I'm trying to get at uh, from that last view. So uh, with that said, one of the things that I like a lot about Neo Sealer Flow is that its ability to wash out, uh, excuse me, its ability to clean out of the pulp chamber and not wash out of the canals. So here, I instrumented this tooth a couple weekends ago, uh, sealed it with Neo Sealer Flow, and here, uh, for sake of protecting my microscope from a giant splash, uh, I, I clean it on the side like this. So you saw how much sealer was in there just a moment ago. And this is just water for my air water syringe. I don't use any alcohol or anything like that. And now it's clean, other than what's right over those orifices. But interestingly, what I really want to highlight here is that there's no washout into the canal space. All the canals are still obtrated uh, fully with, with uh, or the gutta, the gutta percha is surrounded fully, rather, uh, with the neo sealer flow. There was no washout. So I like to call this, or what I've developed, uh, calling it a selective washout. It cleans out really well in the chamber just with water, but it doesn't have any impact on the sealer that's present in the canals. And so I want to make that very clear that even though it's washing out well the chamber, your canals are still well operated uh, with the neosealer flow. And why is that important? Well, cleanliness in the canal is really important. This is a study from Hirsch um, and uh, Dr. Tim Kirkpatrick out of uh, University of Houston Dental School. And what they found is that the composite to dentin bond strength is 22 megapascals. But the bond strength between composite and bioceramics is an order of magnitude lower. We're at four to nine megapascals. So to me, that directly says that we need to make sure our uh, chambers are clean because that's what we're bonding to. And if the dentin walls are impregnated with bioceramic, especially in a case of a post and core, how do we know we're getting a true bond and really uh, getting the the advantages of the bonding material that we had before. And I really like this quote from, from Dr. Ann Koch, is that the restoration starts at the apex. You know, we need to be good stewards uh, as clinicians and endodontists that, yeah, we're treating the apical portion, but that's all to set up a strong foundation for the coronal part or for the coronal restoration. And so here, this is why I think that cleaning the chamber is a really important thing. And that's, that's one of the major advantages I see with neo sealer flow. So why is heat resistance important? You know, let's go to Steve, good old Steve Harvey and the family feud. And what does the survey say? Well, that the warm techniques, uh, the sealer remains liquid in consistency. There is no caking. There's no desiccation. 
you don't need to reapply the sealer because it maintains a sealer quality inside those canals. Uh, again, it doesn't wash out uh, and it selectively washes out the chamber or cleans out the chamber, but does not wash out the canal space. And so again, I think this is a, a unique property for NeoSealer Flow and one that's clinically advantageous. It saves us an entire step of taking a, a cotton ball soaked in alcohol and cleaning out the chamber. And we all know that even after that's the case, you still see this white hue. Well, that's bioceramic. We know that that's decreasing the bond strength of our core, of our post to the tooth structure itself. And you know, in combination techniques where you're using warm in one canal and cold in another, you, know, you don't have to worry about changing techniques from a high flow to a regular BC because NeoSealer Flow does either one with ease. You don't have to worry about, uh, am I getting an insufficient fill or an insufficient seal chemically changing the sealer during heating technique. So interestingly, uh, we've heard a lot about uh, retreatment of bioceramics. And you know that the classic stuff from, from Hess back in the early 2000s is that it's really hard to retreat these materials, especially if there's an apical plug of sealer uh, beyond your gutta percha. So I thought there was a really nice study uh, that came out here recently. Again, this is Carrillo and Dr. Tim Kirkpatrick uh, out of uh, University of Houston. But what they did is they cone fit two to three millimeters short of their apex, and then they in, uh, obturated with the sealer to intentionally create an apical plug of bioceramic material which we know is the hardest part to clean out. So here, the top row is BC sealer, the middle row is edge bioceramic sealer, and the bottom row is neosealer flow. And again, talking about sealer-centric obturation, that's what we hope to, to find uh, in our canals. But what they found was the ability to gain patency uh, was significantly higher for neosealer flow than for the others. In other words, they were able to get through that neosealer flow in the case of a retreatment. So we all know we're trying to gain patency. I want to reclean the entire canal space. And this is uh, some corroborating evidence to show that, yes, we can do that. It just depends on which sealer you're using. And NeoSealer Flows uh, allows us to effectively retreat these cases. They also monitored chair time here. So in other words, how long do you have to sit in the chair and retreat these before it comes out? And they used a handful of solutions, which you can see here. Uh, and again, these are all standardized premolar Roots, so they're we're not talking actual sitting down cleaning out uh, in vivo cases. What they found was that the neosealer flow, regardless of which solution was used, uh, hypochlorite, acetic acid, carbonate of water, or no solution, resulted in less chair time. So not only could it be retreated more effectively, the amount of time to retreat it effectively was significantly lower. So for all for all of those uh, GPs and, and endodontists who are concerned with, is there any retreatability? I think now we finally have some evidence to say, yes, there is retreatability. It just depends what material you're using uh, to operate in the first place. So I want to close with root end surgery, um, showing things here. Again, this is our, our study on, uh, on canines back in uh, 2016, which was published in the Joe in 18. Again, we, we operated these canals with solid NeoMTA+, plus, which is the predecessor to NeoMTA2. Uh, and then we resected those roots and we followed them up at 90 days uh, to evaluate healing. And what we found is that not only are we getting cementum formation at the apex, we're getting ligament formation onto the NeoMTA. We're then getting alveolar bone reformation and normal structural tissues. And that's important because this was a complete root resection. There was no alveolar bone, there was no periodontal ligament or cementum at the time of resection. And the fact that we can regenerate these tissues and their native conformation at their native location uh, is, is really impressive. So here's a case in vivo of a patient that I saw in my practice back in 2018. And she came and you, know, you can see the MB canal here is off-centered. Obviously we're suspecting an MB2. We get into the canal or get into the tooth rather, and we find our MB2 right out of the gate. We obturate it uh, and life should be good. You know, we, we did what we're supposed to do. Uh, we got inside uh, calcium hydroxide and obturated it a second visit. Yeah, we're going to heal here. Well, later down, down the road, that same year, less than six months later, the lesion is getting bigger and the patient has symptoms. So she comes back. And at this point, I'm a little concerned. What's going on? Is there a fracture in the tooth? To me, I wasn't seeing any evidence of a fracture. It all looked to me like a failing root canal procedure, uh, possibly due to uh, extra radicular biofilm. Uh, maybe the lesion was too large for her body to heal. So this was our CT. 
prior to surgery. And now we're going to jump into surgery. And I have a video here I want to show you as well, because I want to show you what the material looks like as we're uh, placing it into the root end. Okay, so here's me using bracelets. Um, I have this little arteriole there that keeps uh, giving me a little bleeding fit. Um, but so here we're placing the Neo MTA putty. And we, I just make little triangles. I just little make little cones with the material, place it right into the, uh, the retro pep prep, and I do it here as well. And you'll see me go back a few times. My goal here is to get as much material into the, the retro prep as we can. Uh, I'm not concerned with blood in the retro prep. Nakufar uh, tells us that that has no effect on the setting or the compressive strength. Uh, so here, the blood there is just a uh, basically a liquid. And we know these hydraulic cements set with liquid. So in the presence of blood here, this is going to help the setting. And so again, I go back several times uh, just to make sure that I have a nice uh, compaction of my material uh, before we start to close everything up and, and uh, call it a day. So here's our resection with Neo Putty. And here's our finished product. And this is in 2019. And we it came back, periapical granuloma. And then we lost our patient to recall. Uh, I've called the patient. I couldn't get in touch with her. I, heck, I thought she had moved. I wasn't sure where she's at. Well, surprisingly, she comes in for an evaluation of another tooth, uh, and I was able to get recalls. So this is a couple years later. We're seeing excellent healing at the root tips, but I wanted to go a step further and get a CT and show that, yes, we are getting that healing, not just on a two-dimensional radiograph, but on three-dimensional radiographs. So nice bone healing. The trabecular pattern may be slightly altered, slightly apical scar-like, uh, but that's healing right up against those um, root apices on the root end resections, showing that there's no fibrous encapsulation that we can view here, or uh, uh, this tooth is not just asymptomatic and functional. This is healed at a three-year recall. So endo our way in my office, you know, we're using it as sealer. We're using it for partial pulpotomies, pulpotomies. Uh, as an endodontist, I don't do too many indirect pulp caps or bases or things like that. But moreover, the Neo uh, family of products allows me to do everything I need to do with three products. I keep the pre or the premix sealer and putty, and I also keep the self-mix uh, powder liquid on hand all the time. Because as you can see, all of these cases require just slightly different treatment. And I know with that material, uh, or with those materials rather, that I have everything I need when that patient walks through the door. So let's just do, quickly do a recap and we'll get into to q and I'm just, I'm a little over my hour here. So current bioceramics, there's a lot on the market and there's pros and cons to everyone. Um, you know, Wild West versus the New Frontier calling uh, a Neo MTA a, a kind of the Wild West. I don't really think that's, that's accurate. Yeah, it takes some historic uh, uh, technology in the sense that it's a Neo or it's an MTA, but its re reformulation is certainly on the on the new frontier of of being advantageous, and obviously you can see so with some of my cases we're getting excellent healing with these products. Uh, moving into the bioceramics in our practice, you know we're all moving from a uh, gutta purchase centric to a sealer centric obturation, um, and the cost of the material something you need to keep in mind. Again, it's not just the cost of the material; it's the cost of the tip, and it's a a, a matter of are you wasting a lot of material when you're using different tips. So those things uh, are things I think you should keep in mind when you're relating it to the uh, practicality of your everyday practice. And then endo your way. You know, are you using just a single product or using a whole bunch of single products or are you using a family of materials uh, that allows you to treat every case as it walks through the door? And so in my opinion, uh, I can't think of a better uh, product line than using the Avalon Neo Sealer or the Neo family of products, because again, it allows me to treat everybody that walks through my door. And with that said, uh, I'm going to get a little plug in here for Canals on Canal. Uh, if any of you are interested in getting some endo CE, uh, come on down to New Orleans. It's a, a three-night, all-inclusive uh, type of event, so you'll get up to 15 CEs if you if you hang around. All the receptions, all the dinners, uh, the hotel is all included. Uh, there's a lot of great speakers going to be there. There's going to be 10 speakers ranging from practice management uh, to uh, 3D guided surgeries uh, and everything in between, including the endo GP relationship. So I, I would encourage you guys, if you're looking for some endo CE, uh, come on down. That should be a, a, an excellent seminar. Uh, and obviously, New Orleans is, is a heck of a time all on its own. So with that, I'd like to thank you guys. Thank you all for tuning in and, and um, uh, checking me out tonight. Uh, if you have any questions or concerns, you can shoot me an email. My email's in the bottom right. And certainly, I'd like to thank uh, Avalon Biomed for, for hosting and sponsoring this event. 
and uh, I'll open it up for any questions. Thank you, Dr. Walsh. Um, they're a very, very nice presentation. There are some questions coming in, but before I get to those, I would like to, again, invite our viewers to use the chat box on the right side of your screen to ask any questions that you have, and we will try our best to answer them. Um, my first question, are these products just for endodontists? Are they easy to use, and can they be used by general dentists? Uh, excellent question. Uh, yeah, these, these materials are not just designed for endodontists. They're designed for anybody practicing dentistry. Uh, so whether you're doing pulp caps, whether you're using them as bases uh, to help prevent needing uh, immediate endodontic treatment, yeah, I think these have a, a huge presence in the general practice world as well, because as an endodontist, I'm using it mainly for sealer, and I'm using it for root end preps and pulpotomies, things like that. But as the GP, I think there's a host of things you can do, including your endodontic treatment, but also things like like I said, the pulp caps, the bases, the liners, things like that that, are, that you guys are doing on a routine basis. Now you can integrate uh, uh, an advanced bioceramic into your armamentarium for those procedures. Okay, next question. Oh, somebody gave you a, a nice compliment. Thank you for a great presentation from uh, Dr. Zafrani. Um, another question. How does Neosealer Flow promote minimally invasive endodontics? Another very good question. Uh, I think minimally invasive endodontics is becoming um, a, a sort of a catchphrase. And, you know, we all want to preserve as, preserve as much tooth structure as possible. So I think one of the ways that Neosealer Flow allows that is firstly with the tip, uh, that the, the small uh, flex flow tip. As you could see, that's fitting well within the diameter of a canal where the maximum uh, instrument diameter there was 1 or 0.9, depending on where we finished. And so that's allowing you to get your sealer down near the apex with a minimal prep to begin with. And the flow properties of Neosealer flow, uh, it's going to flow into all the little isthmus and irregularities as you saw it flow right back up in B2, even in small prep sizes. So I think that would be uh, an advantage for any of the, the minimally invasive folks out there. Okay, next question. Even if I complete my root canals in two visits and use calcium hydroxide between visits, can I still use Neo products for my treatment? Yes, 100%. Uh, just because you're using calcium hydroxide as an intracanal medicament does not preclude you at all from using a bioceramic product in your tooth. As a matter of fact, if you use the bioceramic product as an obturant, you're actually going to get a slow release of calcium hydroxide just in the setting reaction. So you're actually getting kind of a time release dose of calcium hydroxide a second time. So yeah, absolutely. If you're using calcium hydroxide as an intracanal medicament like I do, you're, you're absolutely welcome to use Neosealer Flow on the backside uh, to seal the canal space. Okay, one more question. After placing Neoputty for a pulp cap or pulpotomy, what is the best material to restore with? Do I need to wait to place the final restoration? Uh, no, you don't need to wait. Uh, in this particular case, if you do a pulpotomy or a pulp cap, um, what I'd recommend is putting um, a glass ionomer restoration right over that just to seal the edges and prevent any washout during your etch priming and bonding. Uh, but once that uh, glass ionomer is set and, you know, Fuji, uh, Fuji triage sets in just a couple minutes, you could use Fuji 9, which I think sets in about four minutes. Uh, once that's set, well, then go ahead and etch prime and bond and place your final restoration. Uh, sometimes I've even done it without doing the glass ionomer. You just have to be very careful of the environment, make sure it's uh, well isolated with rubber dam and very careful of the, the amount of pressure of water you're on there. But I think the DFUs recommend placing uh, glass ionomer first. And a uh, final question. Why are bioactive bioceramic materials important to general dentists and endodontists? So as I talked about throughout the presentation, uh, from an endodontist perspective, you know, we're stimulating dentin formation from a pulpotomy. We're stimulating periapical tissue, both cementum, uh, PDL, uh, osseous uh, structure at the root tip. So we're stimulating those. But equally for a dentist, if you're doing a pulp cap, um, is as long as you're able to get that bioceramic material onto the pulp tissue, you're going to stimulate some of that dentin formation as well. And even if you're doing indirect pulp cap or a base, we know that the dentin tubules there are porous, and we know we're getting some of that calcium hydroxide release uh, and hydroxyapatite formation into those dentin tubules. So that there is creating a bigger barrier or a stronger barrier between your restoration and the pulp and hopefully preventing or at least delaying in many cases uh, the need for full endodontic therapy. 
Okay, well, thank you everyone for your questions, but we've run out of time today. So if we did not get to your question, we will answer it after the webinar via email. In the next 30 minutes, we will send you a link to a replay of the presentation and instructions on how to access the CE quiz. Be sure to complete the free CE quiz associated with this webinar to receive your continuing education credit. Thank you again for attending and a special thank you to Dr. Ryan Walsh and our sponsor for this webinar, Avalon Biomed. Thank you and have a great evening.